Well, we pick up our study with where we left off. We've completed four of the six chapters of 1 Timothy. Paul is warning Timothy about the false teachers that are coming into the city of Ephesus and distracting the people and getting them off course. And he takes opportunity in this letter to give a variety of instructions and helpful advice on prayer, on conduct in the church, about church leadership. And when we last talked, Paul was giving Timothy very specific advice on what to do and how to live his life. And we characterize them as characteristics of a, a godly servant. We saw several of them. When we come to chapter 5 now, he turns from focusing on Timothy to different groups of people in the church. In fact, from all through chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, there are four different groups of people that Paul has some advice for Timothy about. So he'll say, Timothy, in regard to these people, I want you to do this. Timothy, in regard to these people, I want you to do this. And what fascinates me about what you're going to see is how much time he spends on the different groups of people. In verses 1 and 2, he looks at a broad group of people. In verses 3 through 16, he's going to look at one small specific set of people. And I go, you just spent 14 verses on one small group of people, and you spent two verses on several different groups of people. So that should be a clue to those of you who love to do Bible study. This is a clue. When Paul spends a lot of time on one particular issue or one particular group of people, you, you should be saying to yourself, there must be a larger problem here. And then it becomes uh, the ability for us to look at those things and to say, I wonder how that would apply to us. What particular situations do we have? But that's just kind of a, a background setting to what we're about to see. So take your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And for right now, I just want to read with you verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says this, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers, younger women like sisters, all in purity. So he's looked at four different age groups. It's not a particular kind of person, but it's a particular age and gender group of people in the church. Older men, younger men. Older women, younger women. Essentially what he's saying to Timothy, I would say maybe two things. Timothy, don't forget about the people. Don't forget about who these people are in your church. Uh, for example, because I'm a teacher, I love to spend time studying. I love to be in my study at church with my books and with my computer Bible study program, and I could spend hours studying this. And if, if I were Timothy, I can see Paul saying to me, Now, Bruce, don't forget about the people. That the work of Jesus Christ, the work of being a leader in a church, is not only about study, it is also reaching the people that we're trying to teach. But I think the other thing that it says to us is this, treat the people in your church like family. Treat the people in your church like family. And I think that's a very good application. Some of us, like me, I have both of my parents. Trudy has both of her parents. And we still have a very strong family. But there might be a lot of you that I'm talking to who don't have a father or don't have a mother. Or, or maybe you're not married and you don't have children or you don't have a husband or a wife. And you say, I I'm just alone. Or I once had a family and now my family has died or they have moved away. And I, and I don't feel like I have anybody. I think it's very important to realize that the body of Christ can function and should function like a family. And I think that's why what Paul says in these two very short verses has great application for the church. In our church back at home, we have some um, um, people who don't have a family or have a broken home. And you just see that when they come to church on Sunday, they just love being there. Uh, I, I think of one woman in particular, she's probably in her late 30s, never been married, but she has a son who's in uh, fourth, fourth or fifth grade. And she's not able to have a very good job, and she, is, um, she has health issues, she has relationship issues, but she comes to church and you can, you can just see the joy and peace on her face. 
She, she comes and, and it's just like, Pastor Bruce, it's so good to be here today. And when she leaves, she and her son leave. And her son has had lots of problems. He has actually been in what we call foster care. He, he did some bad things in the school. He did some bad things in the community. And then he's been removed from his mother's care to stay with a family who they think is more healthy. And yet what, they get to come together on weekends and they come to church and he calls me names and I call him names and we laugh at each other. And th there's something that this little boy likes about me that he doesn't have a father, but that there are men in our church that he can play with, that he can joke around with. I think that the church can be, should be, and must be like family. Let me look at these four groups just a little. Look at the particular admonition for these four age and gender groups. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Timothy, you remember your father? He was a Greek, he was not a believer, but you're, you treated him with respect. Timothy, it, it would be easy for you in this church with all of its problems to treat the old men as if that they were part of the problem and not part of the solution. And Timothy, you, you might look at these old men and say they're too old to understand, they're too old to care, and they're just a problem in the church. Timothy, if there's ever a time when you have to rebuke them, I want you to talk to them as you would talk to your father with respect. I remember in our church, we have a leader in our church who is an older man. He's a grandfather and he may even be a great grandfather by now. There was something in our church, there was a decision of our congregation that we need to make, needed to make. And in our meetings, preparing for this decision, we had had a good discussion and he disagreed with some aspects of it, but I thought at the end of our smaller group discussion that he was at least willing to go along with the decision. So now it's time for the congregational meeting. And the congregational meeting begins and this particular issue that we're going to decide that night is being discussed. And all of a sudden, he stands up in the middle of that meeting and he takes out a piece of paper and he's written down some thoughts and he says, I have some concerns about the decision we're about to make. I've been talking to some other people and we are concerned and if we do this decision, I don't think it's in the best interests of the church, something like that. And in my heart, I went, what are you doing? He's a leader in our church and he's undermining what we're talking about in this meeting. We talked in this small group meeting and he didn't completely agree, but at the end of the meeting, I had asked them, are we in agreement? Are we okay? And he had been one of them that had said, it's okay. But he went to this congregational meeting and he, he, he read his letter and I went, how are we supposed to be unified leaders and lead this congregation and you're dividing us? I was very, very angry. I was boiling inside. I was sitting in the meeting and I was trying to, on my face, keep composure. Trudy was sitting beside me and I'm like, when this meeting is over, I'm going to talk to this man and I would like to shred him to pieces. And the words of this scripture came to my mind. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? Can't I rebuke him? Can't I tell him what he did wrong? Or are you saying that when I tell him that he should not have done this, that I should do in an encouraging kind of way? So here's what I did. The decision was made and it was, it was accepted, fortunately. The meeting was over. I went to one of the other elders in our church and I said, brother, would you come with me? I need to meet with this older brother. And he said, yes, I will. So the three of us went into my study and we sat there and I, I spoke to this older brother and I said, brother, I think that what you did in there was wrong. But what I did with my voice is I kept calm but I was firm. I tried to honor the intent and the words of this verse, 
that as I said to him, I said, you had a chance to talk and you told us in our meeting that this was going to be okay. Oh, but I changed my mind and I talked to some other people and I said, brother, you're, you're not helping us show unity as a group of elders. And it was so good that I had brought in this other brother to listen. And, and I said to my other brother, the, the, the other elder, I said, if I'm wrong, you correct me because I don't want to talk to our older brother in a disrespectful way. And I said, you tell me if what I'm saying is incorrect. And you know what he said? He said, Bruce, what you're saying is right. And he spoke to the older brother and he said, you don't understand what you are doing that was harmful to our church. That meeting was very, very difficult. And it took months for our relationship to be in harmony again. But you know what happened? I think that the older brother, the elder in our church, developed a new respect for our conversation. That, that we are in okay relationship to this day. He still has worries, he still has concerns, and I affirm them. But I tried to honor what this verse said. I didn't rebuke him and yell at him and put him down. I invited another brother in and I said, uh, Brother, my older brother, please, we, we cannot operate in the church this way. I tried to talk to him as if I would talk to my own father, who is a godly man and a man that I respect. So that's the older man. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. He says, treat the younger men like brothers, teammates. Get along with them. Encourage them. They're on the same journey as you. Timothy, in your church, there are other 30-year-old men and 20-year-old men and 40-year-old men that are in that general age group like you. Timothy, take them on the journey with you. Treat them like brothers. Don't treat them as if they're somehow second-class citizens. Third, older women, treat them like mothers. In the Jewish culture, when a woman grew old, especially if her husband died, which we're going to hear about the widows in a few minutes, he said, often society would cast them off to the side that you're not important. Timothy, I want you to treat the older women in your church as if they were your mother. Timothy, you remember your mother. You remember your grandmother. How special they were to you in your life. How important they were to you in your life. I want you to treat them in such a way that when you talk to them, when you treat them, it is a reflection of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And then fourth, he says, treat the younger women like sisters in all purity. Remember I told you about the culture in Ephesus? There was prostitution. There was exploitation of young women. And, and Timothy, being a young man, could look. And I'm just imagining that the city of Ephesus is full of beautiful women. The, the first time I came to Moscow and I walked around Red Square and the different shopping places, I says, is every woman in Russia so beautiful? I think you have more beautiful women here than we have in America. I don't know, maybe you don't think so. But my eyes were like, wow, everyone is beautiful here. I said, I'm a married man. I must remind myself of that. Watch your eyes. Watch your thoughts. And I think that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, you're a young man. There are beautiful women here in Ephesus. If you let lust into your eyes and hit your mind and hit, affect your heart, he says, you're going to ruin your ability to lead in this church. He says, I want you to look at these beautiful women in the church as your sisters. And I go, hmm, I have two sisters. They're beautiful young ladies. They're married and they have children. I treat them in a, in a certain way. I have affection for them. I communicate well with them. I enjoy them. So you want me to treat the young women in the church as if they were my sisters. Okay, I can do that. But I think the bottom line that Paul is saying to Timothy, he says, Timothy, don't forget the people. Treat them like family. Don't just bury your, your nose in a book all day long and just study, study, study. Be with the people. Learn how to treat them in a God-honoring way because of the problems you have in your church. You need these people to be a part of your team.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.